It is Sunday, May 3rd, and welcome to the daily COVID-19 Task Force update. I'm Joe Delarone. On the program today, we'll have a surprise visit from Dr. Annick Gauthier, along with Lisa Westaway, talking about the reopening of uh, services and businesses and all of that sort of thing. Uh, we're going to have some different perspectives on that and uh, we're looking forward to it. In the meantime, though, we'd like to start things off by welcoming my old friend and colleague and now news director at K1037, Paul Graf. Paul, how are you today? Good, thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you for having me uh, here on the Task Force yeah. uh, Daily Briefing. Yeah, I'm glad you got the, uh, the memo on the same purple shirt. We're good to go. Um, so, first of all, um, you have been, like many of us here, here just about every day. You've been working uh, five, six days a week, sometimes seven. Uh, just give us some perspective from your view uh, from the time you started and where we're at today. Wow. Uh, you know, it's something that, that, that Lisa and Lloyd have talked about quite a bit and Arnold as well and, and pretty much everyone involved with the task force that it seems to change uh, often hour by hour, a little less so, of course, now. Uh, but, you know, as everybody was figuring out what to do and how this was growing and how quickly it was growing that the rules were changing and, and it made it very difficult in order to report. And, and so, in fact, we've, we've sort of changed the way that we report. Uh, prior to this, every, everything that we did, uh, you know, the morning uh, news reporter, myself, would leave a packaged uh, report on the day's big news for the afternoon and then the afternoon would leave something for the morning. We've barely done any of those in the last two months because everything has been changing hour to hour. And we realized that the news would have been, even for radio's sake, would have been dated uh, two hours after we first reported on it. So uh, that's been one adjustment. The other adjustment is that because it's coming in so much and, and so often that we're constantly rewriting scripts and, and making sure that the accurate information is out there and that information coming uh, only from the experts and verified experts. One thing that uh, was interesting, of course, yesterday we had Greg Horn on, on, on our program from Uriwaze, and he's coming from uh, a Ghanawaga perspective of someone who is here 24 hours a day. You're mm -hmm. coming in from outside the community, coming in here. What's, what do you notice that's different from the two solitudes, so to speak? The thing I've talked about, and I've talked about it on the radio as well, but with a lot of my, my friends and, and family members, uh, is that in, in Nanawage, it's, it's really a model. And, and it's because of this program that I'm appearing on now, because of the task force, because of these daily briefings, uh, it's a really a model of what Quebec was, but no longer is. Canada and the rest of the world should be following because the task force is really put it together for the community of Gunawage and, and has made all of these moves and put in all these measures in order to, to protect the community. And it, it sort of needs to grow from there. And it did for a while, but then there's obviously been a break with that in the, in the last couple of weeks, unfortunately. So the difference is, is that I find that the public is not as well informed outside of Gunawage and, and that's a huge, huge pat to, to the job that the task force has done. Um, one of the things that uh, comes to mind here is that with the, the, the special challenges, uh, even K1037 is in a different position than it had been before. You don't have no staff kidding. running around all day and a midday program and a this program and the evening program. We're down to very bare minimum. So that's, that's had to be a real challenge on on you as the as the news director tell us a little bit about that well you know listen i, I found myself in this building and, and and i'm here today on a sunday afternoon which i normally don't do when you know we're quote unquote normal um found myself in here alone uh, during the week and that's really strange uh certainly i miss my colleagues uh you know it, it's it's difficult in fact we, we had a, a social zoom get together uh early last week just to you know, catch up with everybody and see each other. And 
and that was nice to reconnect with people, but it is different. Uh, it, it, it's been difficult to do business. I obviously don't work on the business side, but you know, I, I'm, I certainly realized that we're not running bingo. Uh, it's difficult to get new advertisers in because so many businesses are closed. So I know that's, you know, the blood and guts of the radio station and, and how you make the engine run is with dollars. And there are very few dollars coming in, but it, this is an essential service in terms of getting the information out to the public and in a succinct way and, and, and telling the story so that it can be uh, managed through through bite-sized pieces by, by the public. And, and so uh, I realize, you know, that that's, extremely important but you know, not having the resources to to go out there sure i mean I, it's radio so we we do our jobs we've adjusted in in recent years you we rarely have reporters on the road unfortunately it's just the nature of the way things are so so much of our job is done by phone calls or zoom calls at this point as well mm -hmm. uh one thing i like about uh, your the daily updates on k1037 is that in, uh, in our daily updates, they're pretty much a presentation to the community, uh, whereas you get to talk to the people on the task force or people who are uh, in the, on the front line. So it's, it's kind of complementing what, what gets done here, and I guess at, at the end of the day, we have an overall picture because you're running both. Well, you see, and, and that's the thing. We run it in the afternoon and, and you know, live on... on here on, on K1037's Facebook, where it's live right now as well, and on air during the week. We don't even have the staff here to do it on the weekend, unfortunately, to, to run it on the radio. So if you were to put on the radio now, Sonny Joe's show would be on, uh, or Mike Sky. Mike Sky, no, he comes on at 5 o'clock. You see, this is <laughs> things have changed so much, but it, it's recorded. Mike, Mike can't even come into the building. Uh, but you're absolutely right. So I realized early on that there were so many questions being posed when the task force came on and made your presentations that I felt it was important for the community that we got those questions asked directly to the task force members and started inviting them in. And it, it's become a standing appointment every morning right after the news, generally a 20 minute or so interview where we can, you know, ask the, the deeper questions and uh, as, as Arnold had said last week, Arnold Lazar, he said, you bring up one issue and it raises 250 other issues. And so that's, you know, where our jobs come in as, as reporters to ask about most of those other 250 within a specified time limit. All right. Anything else you'd like to add before we uh, move on? Uh, no, I, I mean, it, it's, I, again, every day I'm impressed with, with the way things are being handled in Gunawagi, that uh, there have been no serious cases that we've had to report on. And, you know, this is, this is a case as journalists that it's different. It's different for us because we're living it too, just like everybody else around the world. And, and it's, it's not very often that that happens. Like we report on a story and, and we can, you know, sit, sit away from it and judge it. Uh, or not judge it, but look at it objectively here. It's very difficult to do that because we're living this just like everybody else. We go home at the end of the day to our families and, and you know, we have to deal with them in, in the sense of how this pandemic is affecting their lives and our lives. And so, so it, it helps in terms of asking the questions, but it also hinders because it, it makes it so difficult in order to live and, and do our jobs and, and the pressures that everybody faces and, and we're not immune to them. Uh, in the media business. All right. Well, you've been doing a great job, Paul. Keep it up. Stay healthy because uh, it's more, it's important that you keep up this good work. No, for having me. All right. Paul Grafe is the uh, news director at K1037. He also does some writing for the Eastern Door on occasion. Uh, as a matter of fact, he did have a story out there this week. Uh, coming up in just a moment is uh, Dr. Annick Gautier. She's going to be uh, talking about the uh, medical perspective on the reopening, which is inevitable at a certain point things are going to reopen so she'll be talking about uh, what the medical perspectives are and she comes from a good uh, point of view because she's the tax the task force medical advisor uh, before we get to her we have a couple of things to do technically so i just want to mention a, a couple of things first of all uh, Paul mentioned uh, Arnold Lazar and i just want to offer uh, congratulations to to Arnold and all of his family on the addition of their grandson, which was uh, just the other day. As a matter of fact, he was on the air and then left. And then uh, soon afterward, all of the uh, 
all of the action sort of began, and uh, so now they have an addition to their family. And uh, one other thing as well, I'd like to congratulate uh, Deho Deer, who was the uh, winner of the Jesse Deer Memorial Media Scholarship. He was uh, honored with that earlier this week, and I just thought it would be nice to mention because uh, uh, he worked uh, with, with Paul and all of the local media as well as a reporter with the Eastern Door. So with that, I think we're good to go. Uh, Dr. Anik Gauthier joins us now, and uh, we're very pleased to have her. So let's bring her on. Nyawa. So today, um, I'm going to use the time, and I actually am going to, we're going to split the screen, and we're going to actually have um, a presentation uh, that I gave in pretty much the similar um, uh, features to the task force uh, earlier this week, and I thought it would be useful for you uh, to see it as well. So I'm going to talk about the reopening strategy and give you a medical perspective on it. Uh, next slide, please. So the overview of what I'm going to talk about is um, where are we right now, uh, some issues that we see. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about immunity, uh, what definitions, what the goals and what the vectors are because that's something that comes up often in questions. And then I'll end with the public health um, ANSPQ, so that's the research arm of public health in Quebec, uh, their projections. Next slide. So at the beginning of this, back in January, I even thought, you know what, this COVID-19, this is not much. It was just in, in China. There was very few cases, in like end of December, beginning of January. I thought, it's just like a flu. But this isn't just a bad flu. So this uh, graphic here, taken actually from the Financial Times, you can see on the right-hand panel, uh, there's uh, little uh, insets of the US, Sweden, and Canada. But first, I want to draw your attention to the bigger graph which looks at the daily death tolls that are actually now peaking or falling in many Western countries. So you can see in the sort of uh, gold color is China that goes all the way down to like zero, so they're actually under control. But you can see at the beginning of that yellow, it goes up, up, up. You can see the US in, in pink at the top of the curve, that's actually very high and the death rates are still uh, climbing in. Um, you have Italy and Spain and France that are, you know, have gotten to the top of the deaths and now they're sort of uh, going down. Uh, but there are some countries like Iran that are sort of stabilized. Um, so th th globally, this is looking a little bit better right now. However, if you bring it, there's many countries, and this is where I look at the insets of the blue of the U.S., Sweden, and Canada, where the daily death tolls are still accelerating or, or uh, just about plateauing. And I, it's important to note that these graphs, it looks like Sweden and Canada, that there's a gray, a gray graph underneath it that's going to come down uh, to the bottom, to zero, but that's actually not the case. The, the, where the blue dot is, that is where we are in time. So we hope that in Canada, by uh, keeping up the measures and then by gradually, very incrementally loosening some of the measures, we will actually be able to take it downward and have our death toll decrease. The next slide uh, is, so we're, I, don't, I know you're not seeing it, so I'm not going to talk for a second until the slide comes up. Is there a slide? Give us a second. There are technical difficulties. We'll get a slide in a second. All right, so now we see that there's um, the COVID-19 is causing excess deaths. So in, in this is US data. And in the orange is what you see. These are excess deaths beyond uh, the, the, uh, the average that you would see uh, in this historical time period. So again, it's not just the flu. The flu does not cause this huge amount of deaths that are beyond what we normally see. Going on to the next slide, and uh, uh, we'll, uh, you'll be able to rewatch the video and you can actually grab that link of a, a website because it's quite interesting. It's the graph that's on the right, which is blue and yellow. Uh, how it works is that you can actually see at the beginning, and this is dating back from January, looking at the top 15 causes of death in the U.S., you go with COVID-19 at the beginning is down at the bottom, below lung obstruction and Parkinson's disease, and then gradually over time, and it's actually quite amazing that it goes over and over and it's getting up be be above chronic lung disease, above accidents, above cancer, and then heart disease, and it, it, it teeters between heart disease and COVID for some time until we get to the present time where COVID-19 in a, a weekly uh, uh, average of deaths is causing more deaths than every other disease combined. I'm not saying that cancer is still not scary, it is, but it's just in this uh, uh, short amount of time, uh, COVID-19 is uh, more deadly. 
On the next slide, I'm going to discuss about um, the devil is in the details. We know we need to re reopen. The question is, is when and how. Um, so before, uh, and I'm going to discuss in a second that the World Health Organization had their goals, but before they had their goals, I had my goals that I shared with the task force of goals that we needed prior to opening up. And some of them are technical things, but I'm going to describe them in detail on the next slides. So the first is that the COVID-19 transmission has to be controlled. We have to have an R effective under one, and I'll describe that on the next slide. Two is the wild scale uh, ability for COVID-19 testing. So we need to be able to test widely. The third is the ability to isolate and track new COVID cases. So if we go on the next slide, I talk about what our effective is. So you might have heard, um, I know we've talked about it here before, uh, you've heard in the media, R0. So that's how, and that's if you look at the, the graphic, infographic in blue, you see the blue man in the, when R0 is under zero or equals to zero, it doesn't, that blue man who's infected doesn't infect anyone else. Whereas when you have the, uh, in an R0 is equal to one, for every one person you, uh, that's infected, they pass it on to one other person. And then if an R0 is equal to two, that means for every one person, they infect two people. And then those two people infect another two people and so on. So uh, what an R effective is, it's coined by this group in New Zealand, uh, uh, published by Dr. Binney et al. And the idea is in this, is that R effective is um, what happens when you, after the effect of adding measures or not. And what they said in this paper is that Quebec actually had the highest R effective in all the jurisdictions they were looking at. And they were comparing New York, many different states, including New York State, uh, to New Zealand, to other countries. Quebec was the highest, where it was 5.37. So that means every person infected, infected another five, a little over five people. Now, with the measures of uh, closing down, of uh, social isolation, social distancing, hand hygiene, we've actually been able to pull that down to 1.1. However, in order to uh, control a disease, you need to have the R effective or the R0 under one, and we're not there yet. Next slide, please. So, the second point is wide scale ability for COVID-19 testing. So on the top uh, pictures, we have uh, the swab, which is an RT, RT, PCR. And so that's looking for viral RNA, putting a swab in the nose and then a lysis buffer is like opening up the cell so you can actually detect the RNA. And then the next thing is the RT, PCR machine, which, uh, which uh, can uh, detect the actual amount of viral RNA and see if you're COVID positive or COVID negative. Now, we need, ideally, I'd want it results back in less than 24 hours. Uh, I know that some emergency room situations when we really need to have the results, uh, we can actually, we're getting results in under six to eight hours, uh, but on a general basis, we're still getting results in 24 to 48 hours. This is a lot better than it was at the beginning. I am sure that some of you initially who were tested, it was like a five day or a six day turnaround. Now it's much faster. Uh, and Quebec, uh, if you might have heard that Dr. Arruda announced on Friday that they're planning to scale up to doing 14,000 tests per day as of next Friday, or this coming Friday, sorry. Uh, however, we're not there yet. And right now we're testing about five to 6,000 people a day in Quebec. Uh, we need to be able to test people to know their viral load, to know who needs to be uh, self-isolating or not, and to be able to track uh, their, uh, their contacts. I, I put on this slide serology, so antibody testing. Ideally, we would actually have easy antibody testing as well before we would open up uh, completely. Um, the current rapid methods for looking at antibodies to COVID-19 are not recommended for use for detection and for understanding if someone's immune or not. They are not sensitive and they're not specific enough to COVID-19. Therefore, we cannot use these tests at the moment. I know and they're, they're on the internet, you can even go buy them, but please don't. They are not recommended or uh, approved by Public Health Canada and the Federal uh, Drug Agency of the US has actually re uh, re uh, decided that they're no longer should be used. On the next slide, just give it a little second to have a break. So the next slide, so we're talking about abilities to isolate and track new COVID-19 cases. So we need apps and increased resources to public health 
to track new cases as they are doing in some jurisdictions like South Korea. Um, I know Alberta just announced, I don't know if anyone saw it, on the, that they're actually tracking cases. However, those are not tracking with um, a GPS signal in your cell phone, it's actually a self-monitoring. Um, uh, in South Korea and other countries, and this is an example of an app that I've shown you here uh, in the UK, uh, they're actually able to see, so the dark, uh, dark burgundy man is uh, someone who has COVID-19 but they're unaware that they have and they have no symptoms and then basically this uses a bluetooth device to trace contacts within certain limits so as this person went from home to the train to work uh, back to home and then on the second day so for example day two oh uh, Mr. Burgundy man becomes uh, symptomatic, starts having a fever, difficulty breathing. He goes, gets his COVID test. We have the results in less than 24 hours. We say, oh, you, at that point, he was self-isolating. That's great. Now let's go back in time and using this app, they can actually track who uh, that man came in contact with and therefore self-isolate those people, ask them to stay in quarantine or self-isolation and then test them as needed. And that's really what we need to be able to do to uh, clamp down on the virus. The next slide. So I mentioned my three wishes, but the WHO, the World Health Organization, has additional criteria. So they want outbreak risks in highly vulnerable settings to be minimized. So that's, in, in, in our case in Quebec, it's really our long-term care facilities. We have been very, um, I, I was going to say lucky that we haven't had any in, at KMHC or at uh, Elders Lodge or ILC. However, I don't think it's luck. I think it's that we've been working very hard. We have amazing staff members, amazing nurses and PABs and uh, security and uh, housekeeping, uh, as well as the kitchen staff, everyone works hard to make sure that our most vulnerable people stay safe. The second is workplace preventative measures are established. Lisa's going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. The third is risk of imported cases are managed. And the fourth is communities are fully engaged. And as Paul mentioned, uh, I am so proud to be part of this community, community because uh, we really are a shining example of uh, communication, information, and making sure we're making the right decisions at the right time. So it's really a, a pleasure, uh, even in this difficult time, to be uh, surrounded by such a, a group and a community of, of dedicated people. I'm going to talk a little bit about immunity and then end off on ESPQ data and then I'll pass it off to Lisa. So immunity, I'm just going to go over this. It's something I had mentioned. It's the next slide. Uh, so it's a definition, so I talked about this before, so I'm not going to go into it. Remember, natural immunity is after um, immunity that acquired after you've had an infectious disease. It takes uh, two to four weeks to develop it. Herd immunity is about having all the people who've either been vaccinated, which cannot be done in the case of COVID, or who have um, been uh, contracted it naturally, uh, having enough of those people so they can actually protect the population. So the ideal for herd immunity is 90%. The goal for uh, COVID-19 to ensure uh, good enough protection would be a 60 to 80% immunity. But it's right now in Quebec, we have about a 5% immunity and that's not based on antibody tests, that's based on uh, people that have recovered from COVID-19. Now, even in countries like Sweden that never closed, they kept everything open, they had huge death tolls. Uh, and immunity has not been um, uh, up to the level we would want. They had initially had mentioned uh, a week ago that it was 30%. However, it's even less than that. Um, another last point is who is the vector and this whole point of, of children going back to school. I know in Ganawagi we've made the decision that kids are not going back to school. There's um, uh, but there's still plans in Quebec. Um, it doesn't seem that children are the major uh, carriers of this disease, but it does mean that the adult population is. Um, and I was jokingly telling a friend, it, yeah, if, if, even if kids aren't the, 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 the carriers, we can't send kids driving on their own to go see their grandparents. So it's still a time that you actually need to actually uh, uh, keep your loved ones uh, safe and protected. On the next slide is, um, how to develop immunity is when we are ready, these, all these conditions we talked about are satisfied, then we'll be able to open up. Um, then it's a really a slow and steady with a constant delay of two to four weeks. So that at each stage we can see how effective it is and what the effect of, um, of opening that uh, either business or that population is so that we can know if there's going to be excess COVID cases, excess deaths, excess hospitalizations. 
It's important for everyone to understand that ethically, we are conducting a social experiment by doing this, and there will be lives lost. So if you go on to the next slides, this is where the um, Public Health of Quebec has um, their projection. So a few weeks ago, or now it's, it's time seems to go by so quickly, but it's actually only just a week and a half ago, uh, they released their projections uh, talking about uh, no intervention, so that's the line that goes flying up. Then we have a pessimist number of deaths, and then we have an optimist number of deaths. And we were always at the optimist level right now. So we're doing really well because of our um, measures that we've put in place. If we go on to the next slide, these are the new cases that are symptomatic, and assouplissement means a lightening of the measures. So that's that point in time, but you will see that there are, is going to be an increase in number of cases, both if you're in an optimist and in a high number increase in cases if you're in a pessimist scenario. And it's very important to note that these scenarios were based on only having 10 to 20 percent extra interactions than we do now. This is not talking about 50 percent, this is talking about 10 to 20 percent. It's not a lot. Now go on to the next slide, this is when we're talking about deaths. So in the optimist scenario, yeah, the deaths hover, but they still increase. So we have to, as I mentioned, this is a social experiment, and we will be expecting to see deaths. In the pessimist scenario, you see there's a large number of deaths. And that's why I think an urge, and the task force is working very strongly on this, to do this slowly. I am now a pleasure to ask Lisa to come up. Lisa Westaway, our Executive Director of KMHT, is going to talk about um, other measures globally as well as uh, in Yanawage uh, and what the task force is looking at for uh, reopening strategy and the revitalization of Yanawage. Thank you. Thanks, Anik. So I'm going to repeat many of the elements that Dr. Gotze just mentioned, but a little bit in a different perspective. So. Um, we take all of these elements into account when we're making decisions at the task force about the reopening process. So you just heard the medical, um, the medical perspective. We've also looked to other countries who are a little bit ahead of us in the reopening plans to look at what are some of the elements that were especially important for them in having success in reopening. So what can we learn from countries like Denmark, Israel and Australia? Uh, Austria, actually, sorry. Um, the first thing for them that was especially important was to identify that businesses and organizations are responsible for protecting their employees. This means that measures, new measures that are implemented, so again, it's not going back to the old normal, it's the new normal, that there are new measures being implemented in, in the organizations and in businesses that ensure that protection. Um, they also identify the fact that we have to have a need for flexibility. We can't have a fixed plan. We all are used to having control. We want to have specific dates and times. But uh, Nick mentioned uh, in the medical perspective the need to go slowly, to evaluate as you move forward, and then to make changes to your plan as you go along. So that's what we see in countries where they've had success. Again, uh, we have to go slowly in increments of two to four weeks because that's the time that we see it takes for us to really be able to fully analyze what's happening. Um, this is something every country that we've looked at that started reopening process has stated this, and I, Nick mentioned it at, at length in the medical perspective, but we need to have the ability to identify new cases. We have to have intense testing. We have to have electronic surveillance or some type of surveillance plan in place in order to test uh, contacts and, and effectively self-isolate. Um, and lastly, there needs to be enforcement. So that's what we see from the other countries. So I'm not talking about giving tickets, but really enforcing that people are doing what they're supposed to do, that we're self-isolating, that businesses, establishments are implementing the, um, the controls that we're asking uh, be controlled. So all of these elements are elements for success. And so just to sum it up, the key elements of success that we see in these three countries Physical distancing was not mentioned, but it's part of the controls. And we've said this before, but it's really important to repeat it. We see that without maintaining that social or physical distancing, as we're opening up, um, we really, um, it's, it's one of the main areas that will, that will thwart our efforts to move forward. Um, it's important to have appropriate infection and prevention and control measures, hygiene measures, and um, 
all the countries that are doing well right now in the reopening process, they still restrict gatherings. So again, it's still part of physical distancing, but they've really, they've, they don't allow physical gatherings. That's the last part of their plan to reopen. So we have to take all of this information into account when we're doing our plan to move forward. So what is our plan exactly? You heard a little bit about it in the, in, uh, the newspaper this weekend. Um, so just to, just to specify that a little bit, we do have two, um, basically two committees working collaboratively. Uh, so number one is the Gunawage Economic Revitalization Committee. So this consists of Bud Morris, Mac Kirby, Paul Rice and Frank McCumber. They're working hard at a, a phased approach of revitalization for businesses in Gunawage. So you may be surprised to hear that we have over 300 businesses here. So this is um, a task that is not easy. We're looking at uh, industry by industry and we're measuring a uh, level of risk based on uh, many different criteria uh, and they're going to be coming here to talk to you shortly not today but uh, in, the, in the next week or so to give a a little bit of more information about how they're moving forward and the approach they're looking at. The model that they've developed is very, a really good model that we can use also in the task force for our, all of our organizational revitalization as well. So we know that we have essential services in place. We know that we want to increase those um, peop getting people back to work. So the model that we're looking at with the uh, Gunawage Economic Revitalization uh, Committee will be looked at as well with the task force for all of our organizations. Um, so those teams are working really hard right now, they're working collaboratively and basically um, what all of the information that we have right now brings us to is some guiding principles about reopening. So we're not ready to reopen yet. Dr. Godse mentioned all the reasons why. She mentioned the conditions for success that come from her, from her research, from other countries, from the medical, uh, from the World Health Organization. Um, and, but with all that information, we can establish some guiding principles for us here in Gunawage. So what are they for us? Number one is that we want to continue to protect our most vulnerable population. We know who they are. We've mentioned it often. Um, we, at the base of everything we do, that's, that's what is most important. Um, also part of our guiding principles, I'll say it again, we've said it three times already, identification, testing and isolation of new cases. We need to continue to do that, we need to make sure that we're able to do that in a timely fashion once we start reopening. Part of the health check that we're doing now is going to give us a better idea of what's happening in the community and we're going to develop new, way and new ways so that we can continue to move forward and increase the amount of testing that we're doing. And just by the way, um, as I mentioned a couple of days ago because of the health check we're in we're increasing our testing uh, data on a day-to-day -day basis so really congratulations for that and keep answering your phones another guiding principle is preventative measures so what's preventative measures it's infection prevention and control physical distancing increasing or changing our policies and procedures in our workforce so that we protect our employees and we protect our customers. Um, it's modifying our physical space. So these are all the new normals. How do we move forward in a new way so that we can do this in a safe manner that protects all of us? Um, another guiding principle, having a phased approach and flexibility. Um, minimizing risk from external sources. So we didn't talk th about this very much. Anik mentioned it from the World Health Organization. If we look at it from a Quebec perspective, then they're talking more about um, you know, maybe keeping the borders closed as they increase in reopening so that they're controlling who's coming in from external places. If we're looking at it from our perspective, we're talking more about cross-border travel. How do we ensure that people are self-isolating when they come here from outside Quebec? Um, we're talking also about uh, non-locals visiting Gunawage. We know that part of opening business, a huge part of our economic revitalization is to bring back our customers that are not just from Gunawage. So how do we do that in a safe way that allows our businesses to continue to operate and grow and, and actually make money? So these are really, really important elements that have to be worked out before we can move forward. 
Lastly, and Dr. Gotse talked about it, I, I put it last because of how great we are doing, it's community mobilization. Um, it's really amazing through all the efforts that have been made from everybody, from all the community as a whole, our community mobilization is really going very well. However, the important element for success is for that to continue as we move forward. And that's not going to be as easy. So we have to all take responsibility. This is not going to be the sole responsibility of the task force. Community mobilization will be a responsibility of every single member of our community. And that's one of the main aspects for um, positive, successfully moving forward. And we'll keep talking about that as we, as we go along. So these are the elements that we're working on. The two committees that I mentioned are working very, um, very hard, especially in the next week. Our goal, our tentative goal is to present a plan for reopening to you uh, by the 11th, by May 11th. So we hope to present you a plan and that doesn't mean that we're opening anything on May 11th. It means that we hope to present a plan to you that makes sense based on all the elements we've discussed today for moving forward and reopening. And probably between now and then we'll have people from the, um, the revitalization committee who can come and give you a little bit of an explanation of how they're, how they're doing that. And again, like I said, we're working together to be able to provide this plan to you. Um, and in the meantime, we ask that you continue to do what you're doing. You continue to physical distance. You continue to come and get tested when you have symptoms. And you continue to self-isolate when you have symptoms. Not drive around in your car, but stay in a room by yourself so that you're not uh, transmitting the virus to other people. So we thank you very much. We hope that you uh, will enjoy getting a little bit of um, an eye into some of the uh, elements and, and discussions that we have and what we base our decisions on. We thought it was important to share that with you so that you can see that there's a lot of um, data uh, behind the work that we're doing. So um, I, I hope that's helpful. Um, and I actually hope not many of you are watching right now that you're enjoying the day and that you're going to watch this tonight after dinner. <laughs> okay, so thank you and have a good Sunday. If only that included us. <laughs> so anyway, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Gauthier and uh, Lisa Westaway for uh, joining us today. A very, very informative presentation on, uh, on both ends of that. Also, Paul Grafe with his uh, insight from K1037. We'd like to thank you guys for joining us as well. And um, pass the word along. For those who, don't, uh, those who are watching it now, tell your friends watch this episode especially, lots of uh, good information. Uh, just a couple of things before we leave, the health check. If um, you're concerned about it, it's really quite simple. If you're very healthy, um, it'll be a quick health check, because I know, because our family's done it. Uh, but it's, it's really simple. They're reaching out to everybody in the Ganawaga directory. If you have a cell phone and no longer have a landline, if you can call the Cattery Memorial Hospital Center at 450-638-3930, uh, there are a number of extensions. I'll give you a couple of them, uh, 2296 and 2275. There are a couple of more, but that's okay. Um, and then uh, get your health check done. It's done over the phone, and then if need be, they will do some testing. Also, the testing center is still open Monday to Friday, and uh, you can make your phone calls if you want to make a reservation anytime after about 8.30, and then uh, the afternoon from 1 till 4 is when they do the actual tests. And um, that should do it for us, for uh, all of us here today at the COVID-19 Task Force. We'd like to say thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. Yao koa dano, onigiwahi.